Hello and welcome to this week's Weekly Wind-Up with me, Alison Munro. This week we will be looking at the impact of school homework and our modern day toxic culture that seems to be placing increased pressure on pupils, set against a sharp rise in mental health issues amongst them in recent years. For our second topic we will be looking at budget cuts to Kirklees Music School. We will also be doing our roundup of weekly stories. Joining us in the first half of the programme is April Coombs, an experienced teacher. In the second half of the show, we have Tom Meredith, Principal of Kirklees Music School. Hello and welcome to the show, April. Hi. Our first topic today concerns the impact of school homework on young people, as it was reported in the Daily Telegraph in June that one of the country's leading schools, Cheltenham Ladies College, is to review its homework policy over the next five years, following a rise in its pupils suffering from depression. The school is considering scrapping homework as one of a number of measures to help its pupils. Furthermore, an article in The Guardian in January highlighted a rise in mental health issues amongst children and young people and claimed that despite a rise in the number of beds available for them, current levels were still inadequate. In 2004, the government at that time abolished studies into mental health issues among children and young people, and since then no further studies have been commissioned. This suggests successive governments are ignoring the problems children and young people face, how these problems are impacting on their health, and that urgent action is needed to tackle these issues. I'd now like to show you an interview with Alicia talking about the pressures of school and homework on young people. I am aware of this rise um, with pressures in children at schools. I don't, obviously I don't think it's right, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of children, you know, they're not aware of themselves what's going on, like, you know, they're just forever feeling stressed about work and deadlines and I don't think that I don't think it's fair, really, you know, because obviously mental health and children, th the age range is getting so much lower, so they have no idea why they're feeling like this and what's causing it, and I don't think they're aware themselves. And then the fact that there's been cuts to it and there's not been enough done for it at the same time is not fair at all. Yes, I do have some friends with some mental health issues. I've got an older friend who's gay, who suffered from OCD and anxiety when he was coming out that it was gay. He was um he wasn't he didn't get bullied for it necessarily, but he was like, Oh, I might you know, oh, I might snap out of this, I'm not gonna be gay. But then, you know, it really affected him and if he found it hard to come out to his friends and his family, you know, worried what they were gonna think and it made him, you know, really depressed and anxious. And I've also got a friend who's younger who suffers from anxiety and depression. She doesn't feel she's good enough. She doesn't feel that she that she struggles a lot with um, deadlines in college and at school, she did, and she doesn't feel like she can be the best she can be, and she gets really anxious and depressed about that. But yeah, I just don't think she got the right support that she needed, and I don't think, even when she's at college now, you know, she struggles a lot with meeting deadlines, she gets really stressed out, and I don't think they're aware, you know, just think, oh, she's messing around, she's not, she's trying, she's not going to meet a deadline because she's procrastinating, but she, she's trying, but she just doesn't know how to cope, she's not only got any coping mechanisms that work. I think there is things schools could do to help pupils with the pressure of work. I think that they could have, you know, like in colleges I had like an open door service where pupils could go in and talk to somebody, confidential, didn't, have, it didn't go outside that room. I think they need that in schools as well because, you know, pupils, obviously when they're younger they don't really want to talk to their friends about it or even their teachers, they think, oh, they might think I'm weird. So I think if they've got a place where they can go where they feel safe and that they can be confident and com they can be confidential, I think that would be good. I do think things could be done to inform parents of the pressures of their children at school. I think unless they've gone through it themselves, they're probably not particularly aware that young people do suffer from mental health issues because of pressure of work. I think obviously the pressures now are different from when they were at school. And I think things could be done such as at PTA meetings they could, you know, raise this issue because it is an ongoing issue and it's a it's you know, it's getting more and more, more and more children are suffering from it because there's all this pressure from schools because they want the lead tables and all that. You know, it's all about homeschool communication. So if parents know ways they can help their children be less stressed and less 
with, with their work. I think that would work really well if they were aware of it from the schools and teachers told them that. April, I understand you've had a great deal of experience as a teacher, both in private schools and state-run schools, so I wondered what your views are on homework and what benefits it has. Well, as a mum and also as somebody who's worked in primary education for quite a lot of years, I can see both sides of the coin. Um, there are a lot of advantages to homework and, you know, we shouldn't dismiss it outright. I know there's a, a, a move against it, as you've just explained. Um, but um, it's an invaluable learning tool for children and also it's a brilliant opportunity for them to have one-to-one -one, um, learning experience with their parents because very often children at school uh, don't get much one-to-one -one. and so to have that with, a, with mum or dad, especially if it's reading or something along those lines, is absolutely invaluable. So um, in that respect it's, it's a very useful tool. Um, also, it consolidates and reinforces what they do in the classroom. And so, you know, if they've come home and they're not entirely sure about a, a concept or something that they've covered, then talking about it via homework, if it's properly planned, is, is very beneficial. And it enables parents to spot issues that the children have got and help them with them. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a useful tool. Okay. And do you think there are any negatives to homework? Yeah, unfortunately there are also quite a few negatives. It all mm. depends on how it's organised. Um, if homework's set for the sake of homework, so there's no real focus and it's not linked to what they're doing in school, then that could be very negative because the child can just b begin to resent it, not know why they're doing it, not see the purpose of it. Um, also if it's not marked properly, I mean that's obviously a negative because the child doesn't feel that they've achieved anything. Um, and it just needs to be sort of monitored and it needs to be a whole school approach. So children mustn't be overloaded for a start. So if, if they're given far too much homework, then that's obviously going to have a huge knock-on effect on their ability to socialise in their free time. And that's just as important for children as um, actually achieving in school. So, you know, the, the social skills that they get from going to clubs and so on are absolutely crucial and if homework takes up so much time that they can't do that then obviously it's a negative um, so yeah so there, there are negatives as well as positives okay. so I just wondered if you think that scrapping homework would that help alleviate the problem do you think uh, or there, would there be any benefits well obviously in the short term it would because children wouldn't have all that pressure of coming home after school and having extra work to do so it would immediately alleviate that but in the long term, it, would, uh, it wouldn't be a, a solution at all because um, the benefit to a child's education and learning experience um, is quite considerable um, from homework. And so if you remove all of that homework, then they're going to lose quite a large op opportunity to build on what they've learnt in school and to, to improve via, you know, studying at home. And also, it encourages children to be self-motivated and to organise themselves and let's face it when you leave school and you go off into the big wide world you need to be able to motivate yourself and you need to be able to organise your own mm. learning and your own development mm. and homework encourages all those skills mm. so you so in the long term you can't you can't consider scrapping it really in my view mm. do you mm. think do you think pupils needs have changed uh, I think that there are a lot of um, pressures on children these days. Mm. I think that their lives have become um, open to scrutiny in, in every respect because of things like social media and um, just society as it is now, mm. just the media in general. Mm. And so they have lots of extra pressures as well as pressures from um, school uh, exams. The, you know, the pressure to get A star grades in their A levels the pressure to go on to university, um, all of those things. So on top of that, they've, they've also got the other pressures that modern life brings. And so, yes, I think, I think things are much harder for children these days than they were when we were at school. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but um, last month the Education Secretary introduced a, a new law uh, that's going to be introduced in um, 2016 for four-year-olds uh, so that as they enter school they're going to be assessed and I think this has prompted a school in Cambridge, a primary school in Cambridge, to actually start streaming their children 
um, as they as they enter the school at four. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. Do you think it's going to benefit children? Is <coughs> no, I think it's I think it's been badly thought out. Um, the premise behind it is that it's a baseline assessment. Mm. So the idea is that it'll enable the government to compare children when they enter key stage one, um, their ability level to when they leave key stage one. Yeah. But um, the problem with that is that um, it will probably have a knock-on effect on preschool, nurseries, um, any kind of preschool environment because they will then be in the spotlight, especially if these results of these baseline tests are uh, published uh, you know, as part of the national league tables, then all the preschool establishments will feel that their um, input is being monitored. And so I think what will actually happen is that preschool children will stop playing in preschool and they will be uh, formally educated far more than they are at present and um, scientific studies have shown that that is a, a really bad thing to do because children's higher mental functions develop through play so the more that they um, are ex exposed to formal education at a younger age the less opportunities for play and therefore um, those sort of mental functions might not develop as well as they would otherwise um, so and also it could have a, a knock-on effect in key stage one because teachers who would otherwise be getting to know their children in reception and getting to uh, uh, formally, sorry not formally, but um, informally assessing them themselves in their own way that they're used to mm. without any pressure on the child, without any pressure on parents or anybody else. They, they do their own assessments, you know. And so instead of doing their own assessments and then getting to know the children, they will then have to do these formal assessments which will take them away from that aspect of, of school life and, and you know and also potentially um, if they bring in things like streaming then formal education in in reception will be much more um, onerous so yeah I think it I think it'll have a knock-on effect on children's ability and opportunities to play yeah and, so, and also if, when they're older then obviously it's affecting yeah. them as you, as you yeah. said so. well the, yeah. I mean the, that's another issue is that um, Tests have shown that um, that children who are taught formally earlier on resent education when they're older. Mm -hmm. There were tests done in New Zealand, and um, the children there who began formal education at the age of five were no more uh, no more able by the age of eleven than those who started formal education at the age of seven, and therefore um, it showed that it had no advantages. And then the disadvantages begin began to. Um, sort of become obvious because those children who'd started formal education earlier had a much more negative approach to it as they got older and um, weren't as involved as they could have been in their own mm. in their own learning. Yeah, so, sure. Mm. Um, so, so effectively the education system doesn't seem to be allowing for these additional pressures um, on young people uh, and I wondered um, you know, and parents are also unaware of the dangers. It seems mm. to me. I, you know, I know, I know lots of parents. I'm a parent myself, and um, I think as a parent, you are you, you're not aware of this because you don't understand education. You're not an education yeah like an yeah. educationist. Um, so I just wondered if you could. Is there anything that could be done? You know, by schools to kind of tread a I guess a yeah. fine line. Yeah. Uh, well, it's difficult really because schools' hands are tied to a certain extent because obviously the government dictate curriculum and dictate testing and so the, the, they're sort of fairly restricted as to how they can help children with the pressures that uh, they're faced with. Um, so, I mean, hopefully most schools already do this, but the things that, that do help children are um, good pastoral care, so somebody in, within the school who's familiar with the children and who the children trust so if any child is suffering from issues, mental issues, as a result of all the pressures that are placed upon them, they can go to, go to somebody and talk to them, you know. So there's that. Um, and also ensuring that things like homework are monitored and, it's a, and, and ensuring that they have whole school policies for it. So they know who's giving out homework and when and how much is being given out and on what nights, mm. just so that children aren't overloaded. Mm. Um, it's, it's all about looking at, at the school as a whole sort of body and making sure that everything knits together and works together properly. Um, and just making sure that children have um, access to, um, to help if they need it. And, oh, and finally, making sure that schools can um, talk to parents. Good communication between parents and schools is crucial because parents obviously know their children really, really well. Mm. And so if all the pressures of uh, you know, extra exams are beginning to have an impact 
on the children, then the parents need to be feel confident that they can go in and talk to the staff in schools. Okay. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, April. That was You're really welcome. interesting and yeah. you know interesting to to hear. Moving on to our next news item, it was reported in Huddersfield Examiner on the fifteenth of July. Kirklees supply teaching bill shoots up to eight million. Schools in Kirklees are spending more than ever on supply teachers. The cost of providing cover in local schools has almost doubled in two years, despite a pledge to cut the bill. Figures just released reveal the bill for teaching cover in 2014-15 was 8.3 million. In fact, the actual cost was higher as these figures do not take academies into account. Two years ago, it was just 4.5 million and Kirklees Council then said that the bill was reducing year on year. But this year's bill was more than 1 million upon last year. Even excluding academies and several of them were included in previous figures. The increase comes at a time when teaching unions are reporting increasing levels of stress in the classroom and some 18 experienced Kirklees head teachers are leaving this summer, many taking early retirement. Constantly changing goalposts have left some teachers and school leaders feeling they are swimming against the tide as the Department for Education and Ofsted constantly demand, demand more. Once again, a small number of North Kirklees schools accounted for a large chunk of the supply teaching bill. Four of them, Fairfield School, Batley, Dewsbury's Chickenley Com Community School, Batley Business and Enterprise College, BBEC, and Westborough High School accounted for 1.45 million of the total. The weekly wind-up can be contacted by email at info at kirkleyslocaltv.com or on Twitter at The Weekly Wind-Up and on Facebook. Join us after the break when we, we will be discussing the budget cuts to Kirklees Music School with Principal Tom Meredith. Thank you. However large or small your business, attracting new customers requires dedication and a lot of patience. Just like fishing, but you also need the right gear. Rods, reels, Lines, hooks, sinkers, lures, tackle box, tackle bag, net, bait, gas gloves, clothes, and pocket knife lunch. Or you could simply advertise with KLTV. Online, grow your business and your clientele. KLTV, your vision made reality. Should have gone to KLTV. Welcome back. Our second news item concerns a report in Huddersfield Examiner on the 14th of July 2015. Thousands snap up pension bonds in Huddersfield. Thrifty folk keen to get best deal pensioners in and around Home Firth were the keenest to buy into George Osborne's controversial pensioner bond scheme compared to other areas in Huddersfield. Only people aged 65 or over were able to buy the saving bonds from the government at generous rates of interest starting in January and ending a week after May's general election. In almost 5,000 Huddersfield pensioners took up the offer. Some 986 pensioners from the HD9 postcode, which covers Home Firth, Honley and Thongs Bridge, bought into the scheme. Pensioners in parts of rural West Yorkshire to the southeast of Huddersfield also signed up to the Chancellor's offer in droves, according to exclusive figures given to the examiner under freedom of information laws. The age limit and the timing of the scheme led critics to brand it a bribe for elderly people to vote Conservative at the election. And now, moving on to our next topic, I would like to welcome our guest, Tom Meredith, who is Principal of Kirklees Music School. Hello, Tom. Hello. It was reported in Huddersfield Examiner last month that Kirklees Music School has been forced to close two of its centres due to budget cuts of £300,000. This seems outrageous in that these cuts are taking place in Huddersfield, which is a town associated with music, where we have events such as Handel's Messiah, the Mars and Jazz Festival and the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival. And uh, I wondered what this means for you in terms of uh, young people who are interested in playing musical instruments. 
You're right that I mean, Huddersfield and Kirklees is a very musical place and it's a tradition that we don't want to lose at all. Um, we have been faced with that difficult situation. I know that councils across the country have been in difficult situations with having to save a lot of money. Um, and our budget basically, what the council gives us, is all going uh, in March 2016. So we've had to uh, close two of our seven music centres. What we've done is we've made sure that all those children who are um, having um, some kind of experience, uh, musical experience, are able to get to another local music centre, but it's going to mean a little bit more travel. They're not quite as local, they're not quite as um, community-based, which is a, a great shame. So we're, we're very sad that, that it's had to happen, but we've tried to put things into place to make sure that people who are interested in having lessons and in playing in a group can still do so. Good. Yeah. So what happens um, post-2016, Tom? Um, well, we've got the, um, the, the money we save by not paying rent out on, on the, uh, the two music centres. We're also going to have to look at how we're employing our staff. We're, we're looking at basically working with all our teachers um, to make sure that we we have a music service in the future and we can still provide the things that we need to do. We're going to have to do things slightly differently. Um, but it's, uh, the, the hope is that everything will, will uh, be able to continue in some form. Very good. Okay. And what does it mean for the teachers themselves at these centres? There are, um, most of our staffing costs are actually, sorry, most of our costs are staffing costs. Mm. Um, we have very little in terms of our overhead, so we do save, as I said, that, that rental. But um, there will be some teachers who will be working fewer hours for us. Uh, and obviously the, the people who have been there delivering the ensemble experiences are no longer going to be there delivering that. We've tried to make sure that where we've got teachers who are very good at that kind of thing, we've moved them to a different ensemble at a different music centre. Mm. So we're not going to lose their skills and their expertise. It's just that we as employers can't quite offer as much as we were doing uh, in terms of employing those, those teachers. Mm. And what does this mean in terms of scholarships and uh, for people from uh, less well families? Yeah. Who, who want to play musical instruments. Right, okay. yes. I mean, one, one of the things that we've tried to do generally across the board is with the instrumental teaching and the lessons for um, singing and, and instrument, playing an instrument, those lessons are actually basically at break even for us. So those can continue and they can uh, expand or contract depending on the demand that's there. But one of the things that the council money was used for was being able to provide opportunities for some of the children who are maybe going to be going on to be our professional musicians of the future, both in terms of the area of rock or of classical music or of pop music. Those children were given um, some support and they were given um, longer lessons. They were given the ability to sort of to go further into their, those skills so that they could then go on to conservatoires um, and you know, hopefully, as we said, be the professionals of the future. We also had a scheme whereby um, people who were on the Kirklees Priority Passport um, and therefore families who were on lower income were able to access lessons at a reduced cost. Now, unfortunately, that was one of the things that we, or two of the things that we were using the, uh, the Kirklees money for, and we're having to phase out the scholarships and gradually over time the, uh, the, the Priority Passport discounts are going to be um, lessened as well. So we've worked really hard over the last few years to try and make ourselves an organisation which is accessible for people. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, cutting the funding like this does make it less accessible for, for people who deserve it most. That's such a shame. It is. Um, and according to a report in Huddersfield uh, Examiner in May, a uh, Huddersfield cellist made a plea for the future uh, for music and live performance in Kirklees. Um, because apparently the orchestral music concerts that have been taking place in the town hall for the last 150 years may now be in jeopardy and I just wondered if you knew anything about that or yeah. to shed any light on that. Yes, I, I don't have all the details on that but what I do know is that there's, there's been um, some kind of arrangement made whereby they're going to continue it for another year because we do have some stunning concerts that happen in, in uh, Huddersfield and Dewsbury town halls um, and the op Opera North Orchestra comes over and they're, they're an incredible orchestra, it's, you know, wonderful to be able to hear them and for that to be taken away from us will, will be you know a great shame because again it's just lowering that sort of the cultural experiences that we can offer to the, the people of, of our area mm -hmm. um, so I think it's safeguarded for another year but I'm not sure quite what's happening uh, after that hopefully they'll find some way of, uh, of being able to continue it mm -hmm. um, but also there, there are um, local orchestras the Huddersfield Phil and the Slowit Phil and all, all sorts of, of orchestras that um, sort of I suppose on the back of that interest in orchestral music um, are able 
got to keep flourishing themselves. And so you, you don't want to see it as the tip of the iceberg. And if that goes, does it have a knock-on effect? But because the, the traditions that we've built up over so many years, mm. once they're gone, they're very, very hard to replace. I know, and, and um, what, what worries me is, is um, you know, that that's what really makes Huddersfield stand out from, from mm. other, other towns, yeah. because yeah. we have this culture of music. Yeah, we do, and we're very well, well respected by other yeah. areas. I mean, we, we know we've just had lots of groups um, playing in the National Festival of Music for Youth, and they have been through their regional rounds uh, in the Huddersfield area. There lots of them won down to uh, a place to, to perform in, in Birmingham. So they've been there with, with all sorts of, of uh, groups from across the country. Uh, and we know that we hold our heads high, you know, and, and we're there amongst the best of those, uh, those uh, young people performing. We've even had groups who've been down to the school's prom in the Albert Hall in London because they are some of the best in, in the country. Uh, and we want to keep that going. Mm, I'm sure. So. I know, um, just moving on slightly, I, I understand that studies into um, the, the future skills that will be required in, in say, 30 years' time um, have found that the skills that will be needed will be those of, um, I think it's emotional, emotional intelligence, um, creativity, uh, solving problems in a high-octane environment. Mm -hmm. Um, and and excellent dexterity mm. and I just wondered do you know um, it does, would me playing a musical instrument does that actually help the, there's been skills? lots of research that's that's yeah. actually based around that um, and those skills that you develop as a musician I mean, not only the ability to go off and practice on your own and therefore that self-motivation that employers really like to, to look for mm. but also the social skills the interactive skills um, being able to stand up in front of a group to make a presentation if you stood up on stage and sung or or performed on an instrument, then you're developing those um, those self-confidence skills. The social side of things, you know, the, the interaction with people, the, the turn taking, the, the actual listening to other people, um, not just paying lip service to it, but actually really making sure that you are hearing what other people are, are playing, performing or saying, yes. um, and, and that influences then what you uh, bring to a performance. Mm. So there are so many skills that, that are, are transferable from, from music into uh, the workplace that People at university and employers are looking out for, for that kind of thing. There was a, an interesting article in the Radio Times a, a little while ago that uh, was written by Pat Thompson, one of the, the head teachers in, within Kirklees, and she said if something is worth teaching and worth learning, then you can do it through music. Because if you, you've only to look at things like modern foreign languages, and if you learn a song in a foreign language aged five, mm -hmm. then you remember it you know, for, in, into adulthood. And, mm -hmm. I can't remember what I did yesterday, but I can remember the songs <laughs> I studied when I was five. So. <laughs> okay, and finally, just one thing. Um, I know you used to have a, a set, an actual centre in Huddersfield at the former mm. co-op building. That's um, right. Are you, you know, are you, have you, do you have a, a centre at the moment, or is that something you... We're quite peripatetic. In fact, like our teachers, yes. I, I, we have about 60 teachers who travel out around all of the schools mm. in, in Kirklees and, and deliver instrumental lessons and, and singing lessons. Uh, and we also, we have an office which is based in Huddersfield, but when we were based in the co-op centre, it was a vibrant centre. We felt that everything that we did was linked to the music that was made there. Uh, and I think when I, I go around the country and see other music services, the ones that have got those kind of central uh, facilities that people go to and use, it raises the profile of music and it raises the profile of the arts. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's what it would be lovely to have uh, within Kirklees. We noticed that, I mean, £36 million has been spent on a sports centre. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if we could have that for an, a, a cultural centre as well. Because um, it's not just the, the music school that, that's in, in Kirklees and in, in Huddersfield. There are all sorts of wonderful groups that are going on. It would be lovely to be able to give those a home uh, and not for them to be scratching around to make an existence you know, uh, um, all, all the time. To, to actually have somewhere which is a dedicated space and something that you know, Huddersfield and Kirklees can be really proud of. So. Mm. Okay, well, Tom, thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. And now on to our final news story. Uh, it was reported in Huddersfield Examiner on the 12th of July, um, Huddersfield Carnival 2015. Last weekend, an explosion of colour, music and exotic smells filled Huddersfield Town Centre for a celebration of Caribbean culture. Tens of thousands of people packed in the town centre square and streets for the 2015 Huddersfield Carnival on Saturday. There was concern last year about the carnival's future after Kirklees Council was forced to withdraw its funding because of budget cuts. But organisers of the Huddersfield African Caribbean Cultural Trust 
worked extra hard to ensure there was another carnival to remember. A parade of floats carrying ground-shaking sound systems followed by dancers in multicolored costumes made its way from the Hodawi Centre at Hill House into the town centre. While the threat of a downpour was in the air, the rain just held off, allowing for an exuberant atmosphere which culminated with the parade after party in St George's Square. Alongside curried goat, rum cocktails and other Caribbean cuisine, revellers enjoyed live music from a stage at the bottom of the square. The carnival proved a massive boost for town centre businesses with customers spilling out of takeaways and pubs along the parade route. Well, that's all from me from Alison Munro. The weekly wind-up can be contacted by email at info at kirkleyslocaltv.com or on Twitter at The Weekly Wind-Up and on Facebook. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.